murder investigation sort of backwards. And unfortunately, that's onto her friends. So to clear them, she has to introduce some undercover agents into her art punk community and sort of betray her friends. The main character in the book is Adele Proust, and she's an artist, but Adele is also a distortion herself. Adele is a distortion of the traditional bombshell character that's often in crime fiction because she is a very beautiful woman, but she is not blonde, she is not stupid, and she is not evil. She's not any of the things that the typical bombshell is. Instead, she is a real woman ready to go after her art dreams and kind of ignore the way that men stare at her chest. Um, some of the other main characters include um, Jack Thomas, who is Adele's ex-boyfriend. Jack is a sort of high-profile political activist and absolutely handsome and sort of a jerk. And then we have the guy with the black hole eyes. His name is Blake Ingard, and actually we don't really know who he is at the beginning, so we're going to not say much about that. And then Adele's best friend, Marvin. Marvin is really an interesting character because he owns a sex shop, and he absolutely is the most loyal friend that a person could ever have. He will stand by you through anything, life or death. And finally, um, I'd say the next character to talk about would be Greg Fowler. And Greg Fowler is the lead singer for The Fury, which is the local post-punk band around town. They're sort of the number one band in town. Greg's sort of like a man whore. He's a very good looking guy and very much a womanizer. Um, but he's got a soft spot on the inside, and we're going to learn a lot more about Greg, his dark past, and his soft spot. Okay, distortion began sort of as a... I have great love for crime fiction. And since I was a child, I loved Sherlock Holmes, I loved Lee Child, Janet Ivanovich. I just love crime fiction. But it began as a tale to sort of break some of the stereotypes that exist in crime fiction. And I rooted it in some of my own life experience. Um, I happened to live in the Houston Montrose district at the time that it was truly bottoming out. It was falling into almost a ghetto. Um, the crime had become so bad, it was so filled with drugs and prostitution, specifically Korean prostitution. Um, that the neighborhood was literally a place that most Houstonians would not go. And so those of us who lived there kind of lived on a day-to-day -day basis where you couldn't walk down the street without holding your mace or your gun in your hand. Um, taking on danger as you walk down the street, living your life that way kind of affects the way you think. And so as we were living in Montrose, we were all trying to become the best we could be. There were a lot of artists, a lot of musicians, there were a lot of activists there. And so what we found was that there was a great sense of reaching. Everyone there was reaching up to be the best that they could be, but they were surrounded by all these things that were ready to pull them down. And so in some ways, distortion came out of that experience. It came out of the experience of overcoming these really bad obstacles overcoming pure evil around you. I mean, sometimes you're in a place where there really is. I mean, a drug cartel, there's not much more evil than that. And, um, and so trying to walk past that on your way to better things, that's what it really was about. Writing about murder is something that is really actually kind of fun in the modern world because we all are surrounded by situations where you think, gee, I just love to kill someone right now. Well, I can do that all the time, just on paper, so it actually works out really well. But, it only works if I really research it and make it real. And the way to make that real is to interview people. I obviously don't want to experience it, but to interview people, interview police, do ride-alongs with police. And in my case, I just happened to be lucky enough to have worked with members of the FBI on something a long time ago in Houston. And so it's just sort of helped me to stay grounded and know just what the investigation should feel like. It should feel very real. And sometimes when I look at something in the movies or on television, I think, no, it wasn't anything like that. These were real guys. Their wife's on the phone, you know, complaining that they haven't done this or that while they're trying to nab a drug lord. You know, it's just not as noble every day. It's noble, but it's not, doesn't feel noble when you're doing it. And so
so I wanted to bring out that. I wanted to make this a very real investigation. But the murders themselves, to me, it was as if each one happened for a reason in the story. And so they actually became um, much more intertwined with the rest of the plot. So we had interpersonal plot lines kind of mixed up with the neighborhood plot line because the neighborhood's collapsing. And at the same time, people want to come in and gentrify it, which would destroy the art community. And so we have all these different plot lines mixing up. And as that happened, it would just occur to me that, oh, I need to kill so-and-so. And so then I would find the best possible way to do that without revealing my killer. The fun part of writing a mystery is the art of the reveal. There's a great myth that mystery is all about laying a series of clues so that everyone can figure it out. And that is the case. You have your clues in there. Theoretically, you can figure this out if you're really smart. But mystery to most authors is really the art of the reveal. I know everything. I sort of. The characters know everything. I actually didn't know who did it until I was writing the very end. But at the very end, I knew everything. And as I went back through and was looking through the clues, I thought, well, have I revealed enough here? Maybe I should reveal a little more. Maybe I should reveal a little less. It should be that feeling of, at the very end, oh, that's who did it. I didn't know that, but I should have, because, you know, back there, there was that, that, and that, and it should have all added up in my head. So I want to play that little game with you. I want to tease you with a little bit of information here, and then I want to hold back a little more, and then let it go later, and then about three-quarters of the way through the book, if you've been paying attention, you should know who did it.